Good morning. Let's stand and greet one another in the name of Jesus Christ. Make it back to your pews. We invite you to take this time to sign our friendship pads, which are located at the end of each pews. But let me just say, you truly must be God's chosen frozen. We are so grateful you are here this morning, and we are even grateful for all our church members who made the decision to stay at home and uh, We hope, even though you may still be in your pajamas, drinking your coffee, that this will still be a moment of worship. Uh, We need you to pay attention to uh, all the emails that we are sending out from the uh, church office, uh, the Monday morning wake-up call tidbits. It will have all the information you need for changes that we are making, and a lot of stuff has kind of moved around. So please, please, if we send an email out, it is for a reason. Uh, Got a couple things. Speaking of changes, this Wednesday, wonderful Wednesday, just to let you know, the high temperature will be 60 degrees. You can clap for that. That's good. Uh, We have moved uh, Catherine Coffey. Uh, from who was supposed to be our guest uh, last Wednesday to this Wednesday. Uh, many of you know Catherine. She's a missionary. She's an endurance runner. Just saying that makes me tired. Uh, she's an author of a new book. And, of course, she's probably famous in this congregation for being the granddaughter of Kathy Graham. So she is our guest. She will be my guest at 6 o'clock, and we hope you will make it. Uh, to hear Catherine. She will have her new devotional book available, uh, so please, please come and be part of that. The chili cook-off was supposed to be tonight. Uh, We have moved that to February 25th, and because they they keep bothering me, the men's Bible study will start back tomorrow at 5.30? At 5.30, Uh, and we look for it. If you haven't been, you don't want to miss it. Come and be part of our men's Bible study. You got anything? I will point out the insert about the um, dinner and cake auction on February 7th. Hope everybody signs up to come to that. And we still need cakes. So uh, check out that insert if you wouldn't mind. All right. Let's uh, prepare our hearts, our minds, and soul for worship.
The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Let us worship the Lord. We come now to a moment of confession, invited into this time of prayer by God who knows us better than we know ourselves. God who knows how, over this past week or two, we have failed to love Him with our whole hearts. We've failed to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so the invitation from God is that we unburden ourselves of the shame and the guilt of our sin, together as the body of Christ and in the silence of our hearts. And we do so knowing that God's grace is for us, which is why and how we can pray our prayers of confession with confidence. So let us pray together, anxious to hear the good news of the gospel. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with humble hearts, acknowledging our need for your grace and forgiveness. Your word, spoken, called us into being and gave us the breath of life. Yet often we forget the depth of your creation and the life-giving spirit you have bestowed upon us. We confess our sins, our shortcomings, and the times when we have not walked in accordance with your will. Forgive us for the times we have failed to care for the earth and its resources, taking for granted the beauty of your creation. Help us to be better stewards of the environment you have entrusted to us. May we use our days to honor you, to love our neighbors, and to live in harmony with your creation. In Jesus' name we pray.
My friends, listen to the good news of the gospel. Scripture tells us as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sin from us. And so no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what your journey, remember, you are known and loved by the God that made you. And it is through God's only Son, Jesus Christ, we have been forgiven. This is the gospel. Believe it and rejoice. Amen. Good morning. I applaud you hearty souls for showing up here this morning. This is stewardship season for our church. The theme we've chosen for this year, created, connected, and called to be in this world. When I first heard it, I thought, well, what's that got to do with raising the church budget? How, how, how are we going to make this exciting and fun? And then it dawned on me. We are all created in God's image, and our purpose here is to worship him. Where is the number one place that we choose to worship God? Here in this building. And it's here in this building that we all become connected. I know each one of you, and I, ch I cherish you. I think of you as my family. And it's from this building that we are called to take the word of the gospel out into the community that surrounds us. And we do a good job. You're going to hear in the next few weeks statistics. I don't know if you picked up the annual report or not, but you're going to see what your church did for the Lord during the year of 2023 as part of this stewardship campaign. And we're going to have some fun. It doesn't always have to be dry and boring to have a stewardship campaign. I realize when we start talking about your money that we're on the edge of meddling and we will attempt not to do that. But we're going to encourage you when you get this little card, and all of you are gonna get one of these probably in the next week or so. This one's special though, this one's mine. Mine is the first of 289 family units that will fill out a card. That's our goal this year, is for everybody to fill out a card, no matter how, how you fill it out, no matter what your monetary gift might be, or if it's nothing, fill it out. Let us know that you are created to worship here, connected with the other people here, and called to carry God's word from here. So. As number one, I get the honor of signing this in the presence of you guys. And into the envelope and into the plate. Just like mail-in voting, don't feel like you have to wait until February 11th, which is Commitment Sunday, to return your card to the church office. Do it early, do it often. <laughs> Again, thank you all for being a church family that welcomes me, my family, and everyone in this community in here. We praise God for this congregation. Yeah. Oh, oh, I was going to put it in the plate. No, that's fine. Well, that's fine. Thank you. I don't know if that was staged or not. <laughs> Is this part of the fun we're going to have during stewardship? I can't wait for a fun stewardship season. Would the children please come forward and meet me up front for time with the young church?
Okay. Good morning. How's everyone? What a wild week this has been. Am I right? I mean, seriously. Uh, the fun's over, in my opinion. Mr. Jim's talking about having fun coming up in the stewardship season. That sounds great. But um, I'm ready for the snow and the ice to go bye-bye. Uh, I don't know about you. Is Rutherford County, are Rutherford County schools closed tomorrow yet, officially? Do you all have school tomorrow? Probably not. Let me tell you something. My street is a solid sheet of ice from edge to edge. It's shiny like ice. It's about an inch thick. I took a picture of it last night. I mean, it is incredible. You could ice skate on it, but I don't have ice skates. It's just a solid sheet of ice. And I know a lot of other people's streets are the same way. Uh, and I wanted to share something with you this morning that I heard a long time ago, and I think it, it's, it's, it, it's a good lesson for us. I have been told, have you ever tried to run on ice, by the way? It doesn't work very well, right? If you want to move on ice, what do you have to do? You have to move slowly, right? Uh, well, a lot of us have been doing a lot of driving on ice this past week or so. This morning, I wasn't sure I'd be able to make it off my street uh, on, my, on my icy road. This is what I was told a long time ago. When someone is driving on ice, driving their car on ice, you're supposed to pretend that you have a glass of water this full sitting on top of your dashboard, and you're going to drive so that not a single drop ever spills out of the cup and the cup doesn't slide around on the dashboard. Can you imagine driving? I don't know what your family members drive like, your parents, your grandparents. My guess is that if they set this on their dashboard at a regular day, it would fly off as they left the driveway and spill all over the car, right? I know your mom at least. Yeah, um, it would. But when we drive on ice, we, we pretend that there's a, this glass of water sitting on the dashboard and we are going to move so slow and so carefully that it never spills. And that way we can kind of be safe when we drive on the ice. The key word for me is patience when I'm driving on ice. To be patient, to be slow, to be careful. And this week, as I've been imagining the cup of water on my dashboard all, every day as I'm driving around, I thought, you know, this would be a fun thing to share with my friends on Sunday because it's really not a bad way to go through life. When we wake up in the morning and we have school, we eat breakfast with our family, whatever we have in front of us for the day, whatever's coming up for the day, whether we're going to play outside or play video games or what, spend time with our families or our friends, moving slowly, being patient, being careful, these are great ways to live and to spend our day. Not fast, not rushed, not in a hurry, but slow and careful and kind and patient. Don't you think? Uh, so that's my story for this morning. We're going to try to, most of us still have to drive like we have a cup of water on our dashboard, but I want us to live like there's a full cup, I don't know how to finish that image, there's a full cup of water in our hearts, on our minds, I don't know, on our cars, that's right. Would you pray with me and repeat this prayer with me? Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for our church family. Help us to live slow and patient lives. You love us. We love you. Amen. Thanks for listening, my friends. Let us pray together. Draw us close, holy God. As the scriptures are read and the word is proclaimed, let the word of faith be on our lips and in our hearts, and let all other words slip away 
May there be one voice we hear today, the voice of truth and grace. Amen. Today we're looking at Psalm 62, verses 1 through 12. And before we get into that, there is a word that pops up that um, initially I didn't know what it was, and so I looked it up and thought I would share that in case maybe one of you has not used it on a regular basis. The word is selah. I thought I knew what it sounded like it should be, but that was wrong. So in looking it up, and I wanted to know how to pronounce it also, and fortunately it had a recording that said the word several times. It told me it was in the Bible 74 times, so I figured it had some importance, selah. It is probably a musical mark. So that's what you're hearing as you hear us read it, or an instruction on the reading of the text, which we still don't know what that is. So as we read it, we'll just read it, and we'll have to wonder what that is really for. Here is Psalm 62, verses 1 through 12. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall never be shaken. How long will you assail a person? Will you batter your victim, all of you, as you would a leaning wall, a tottering fence, their only plan is to bring down a person of prominence. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths. But inwardly, they curse. Selah. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. For my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rest my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times. O people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together, lighter than a breath, put no confidence in extortion, and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your hearts on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God, and steadfast love belongs to you. O Lord, for you repay to all according to their works. These are the words of our Lord. Thanks.
I have to be honest with you, uh, listening to Jim, he kind of set the bar really high when he said we were going to make stewardship fun. I don't think anyone has ever called one of my stewardship sermons fun, but maybe today this will be fun. Our scripture lesson comes from Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. We invite you to open up your Bibles or the Bibles provided for you as we listen to God's holy word once more. Now hear the words of our Lord. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. No shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. One day the Lord God formed man out of the mud, out of the ground. The Lord God breathed life into him. Man became a living being. Friends, these are the words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Heavenly Father and gracious God, we truly give you thanks for this day, for the opportunity to gather together as the body of Christ and to seek your will for our lives. And as we gather in this room, made holy not by our presence, but by the presence of your Holy Spirit, We pray that your spirit would move us, that it would shake us, that it would transform us. So open up our minds so that we may feel your love. Open up our hearts so that we can understand your work in this world. Now, Lord, may the words from my mouth, the meditations from our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. As we talked about before, we Presbyterians, we're not only God's chosen frozen, but we Presbyterians, we, we pride ourselves on doing anything and everything decently in order. That's our mantra, by the way. We do things as Presbyterians decently and in order. We repeat that again and again and again because it's, it's who we are. It's how we live. And I pointed out that in all the branches of the Reformation, the Protestant church, the only branch that was given birth by someone who was not a priest was John Calvin. John Calvin was a lawyer. As a matter of fact, John Knox, even though Knox studied to be a priest, was ordained as a priest, he too was an ecumenical lawyer representing the Catholic Church in all legal matters in Scotland. It's not by chance that Knox The reformers of Scotland, when they were forming and shaping the new Presbyterian church, that their manual of operation was called the Book of Discipline. And while the Book of Discipline dealt with rules and regulations on how we should live out our lives in the church and with one another, the book's main focus was on the natural order that we must seek in our lives as we interact with God, we live in the life of the church, as we live with one another, in order to avoid the chaos of this sinful world. If you haven't figured it out by now, I love order. 
And I hate chaos. I hate chaos in my life. I hate chaos in this church. And I certainly hate chaos in this world. The whole purpose for me getting away for a week in Montreal and locking myself up in a cabin is not so that I can avoid getting up at four in the morning when the Springer Spaniels are ready to go to the bathroom and eat their breakfast. And it's certainly not so I can binge watch everything that I have missed on Netflix because of Advent. I go up to Montreat year after year for over 30 years so that I can be a Presbyterian, so that I can plan out sermons for the whole year. If and when I finish that task, you know what I do? I don't take a nap. I don't go out and celebrate. I write liturgy. I write prayers and confessions, and believe it or not, prayers and confessions that are actually connected to the sermon I'm about to preach. Why? Because I'm Presbyterian. And I love to do things decently and in order. So stating that all up front, a phrase that has become the vein of my existence ever since I was ordained, is if you want to make God laugh, come up with a plan. I'm being a good Presbyterian and wanting to do things properly. I wanted to give credit where credit was due. So I researched who originally came up with that phraseology, if you want to make God laugh, come up with a plan. And according to the Google, the person responsible for verbally explaining chaos in the life of humanity is the very Jewish Woody Allen. Now I will point out in my research that it is clear that Allen may have said such words, but he's probably not the first. But there is part of me that that loves the notion that this very Jewish comedian from New York has insight into the theological understanding that no matter how well we plan out our lives, something will happen. Something that will happen that will cause us to go off script. Something will happen that will cause the train to go off the rail. Just read your Bibles. Start with Genesis. End with the book of Revelation. We constantly see this story played out in humanity. Where we think we should go in one direction. We know we should go in one direction. We plan to go in that one direction. We even take steps in that direction. And all of a sudden, we hear it, don't we? God laughing. Take this Sunday, for example. I want to be clear if you haven't figured it out. Sundays do not happen in a vacuum. There's a whole lot of planning and preparation that happens before we gather for worship. Sermons are planned out, as I've told you. They're written. Liturgy is written well in advance. Anthems, preludes, postludes, it's all planned out. It's all practiced. And this Sunday was no exception, especially since this Sunday was the start of stewardship season. For some time now. First Presbyterian Church has moved its financial year from an end-of-year calendar to a physical calendar, meaning that instead of our financial new year starting on January 1st, it starts on July 1st. The session had made that decision years ago, and they have explained it to you in the past, so I'm not going to explain it to you today. But all of that being said, The most major impact in the life of the church is that our stewardship season has moved from September to this time of year. And i got to tell you, I love that. 
Because when stewardship season was in the fall, do you know what I was doing? I was looking at all of the SEC football teams and when they were playing, whether home or not, and then I would look at the Titans schedule. I kid you not, the worst dedication Sunday we ever had was when Tennessee was playing at home. I'm pointing at you, Jim. I don't know what happens after a game in Knoxville, but y'all don't seem to make it back. But if that wasn't bad enough, the Titans were playing at home. I'm looking at you, Bill. And that dedication Sunday, I thought to myself, looking at how few pledges we actually got in that day, we might as well close the church down. And if I was thinking that, you know stewardship team was thinking that. Now let me say, Even with such a move, it should be clear that even now, still now, we put a lot of planning into the Sunday. Months ago, we came up with a stewardship theme. You always need a good stewardship theme, and as Jim said, this year's theme is created, connected, called into the world. That sounds great to me, because I came up with it. We had to find a chair and co-chairs, and I'm grateful for Jim Crumley and Rachel and Tim Pope. Articles have to be written. Letters have to be sent out. And on Sunday, February 11th, you will have your opportunity with your pledge card in hand to come to this chancel and place your pledge and your commitment to the future ministry of this church. Like I said, a lot of planning went into this Sunday. Do you know, however, what we did not plan for last Sunday? And snow, and ice, and somewhere I tell you, God is laughing. The last thing I wanted to do this week was spend hours upon hours worrying about whether we would be able to worship here at the corner of college in spring, or if we would have to take worship virtually. For the simple fact that it's not a quick decision. So many conversations have to be, take place. So much planning has to go into this in order to make this decision. And when you think you finally know what you need to do and why you need to do it, and thus you make plans on what you should do, something else happens. And all those well-thought-out plans are thrown out the window again. For example, I kid you not, at 12.35, Friday afternoon, I was having lunch, Barry Ship, and Jim Crumley. And what you may not know about Jim is he's not only the chair of stewardship season, he's also the chair of our property team, who's responsible for clearing out the parking lots of snow and ice. And this year, Jim and I came up with a plan on Monday, we called each other and we said, hey, instead of getting all these members to come out with shovels, because Lord knows we don't want them to break their hips, right? Let's subcontract this out. Great idea, great plan. Only problem was, at 12.35, Friday afternoon, we could find no one to do it. And at 12.35, Jim looked at me and said, John, I think worship needs to be virtual. And Barry looked at me and said, John, I think worship needs to be virtual. And I said, oh, thank goodness, a decision's been made. Worship's going to be virtual. And at 1237, Charlotte Lynn, our administrative assistant, calls me. She tells me not only did we find someone to clear the lot, they were in the lot clearing it as we speak. Worship's back on. And here we are. Yet even when a decision was finally made, we knew and we knew what we were going to do and why we were going to do it. I also knew that whatever decision we made, not everybody would be happy. But on top of all of this, you might be asking, what does any of this have to do with stewardship and being created? 
And I think it has everything to do with this season. Our text this morning from the book of Genesis is the second creation story. This scripture drives the fundamentalists crazy because they do not know how to explain this away or if you even explain it at all, so they don't. But thank goodness as Presbyterians, when we read scripture, we're asking ourselves... Not if this happened or didn't happen. And if it happened, how could it happen? Because if you do that, you might as well try to figure out how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. No, when we read Scripture, we ask two simple questions. What does this say about God? What does it say about our relationship with God? This creation story is different than the first creation story. First creation story in the book of Genesis chapter 1, God does a whole lot of speaking. When God speaks in Genesis 1, everything happens. When God speaks, creation happens. The earth, the universe is formed. When God speaks, he divides night and day, light and darkness. When God speaks, animals rise up from the sea and roam the earth. When God speaks, we're created. But not in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, we're told that as the world was being formed, God decided to take a walk by the water side. And as he was walking, we're told that he bends down. He gathers some mud and begins to form it, shape it, and mold it. And what he has in his hands, it looks like us, but it's not us. It's just mud until God, according to the Scripture, breathes life into us. And man begins to breathe. Even more so, according to the scriptures, God did not create us and decide to walk away. God created us for a purpose and for a reason. First, we are told that God created us to be spectacular. You are spectacular. The hymn writer says we were created fearfully and wonderfully. That is how much God loves each and every one of us. And second, because God created us to be spectacular, then we were created to do God's work in this world, which is at the very heart of stewardship. Jesus tells us that the best way to do this is to love God to love one another is to love our neighbors in this world. But here it is. As my well-thought-out plans were falling apart this week, there were a couple of moments when I forgot why God created me in the first place. All because I was trying to figure out what we would do this Sunday. Has that ever happened to you? In the life you're living, in the plans that you have made out, that when they all seem to fall apart, Instead of remembering that you were created fearfully and wonderfully to do God's work in this world, instead of remembering that we are good, we're trying to hold on to something that is 
slipping from our fingers. I'm just going to be honest with you. With all the snow we had this week, my greatest worry was that if the session had to rearrange worship today, that that this first Sunday of stewardship would be adversely affected. And the outcome of stewardship wouldn't be what we want. Like somehow if this Sunday, if we had to move totally virtual, pledges might not come in as we hope, which would lead to cuts in our budget, which would mean that our mission would be impacted in this world. That's what I was worried about all week long. And I'll take my honesty one step further. My real frustration was coming from the fact that all my well-thought-out plans that I spent time and energy and effort and hours on would be for naught. And I thought about this for the longest time. And I I worried about this for the longest time. And finally, I shared my concerns with with an ancient ruling elder in this church. I mean, I opened my heart to this man. I told him all my concerns and all my worries. I bet you I even had tears in my eyes. And you know what he said to me? The show must go on. The show must go on. Because what does it matter? If it's snowing or not snowing. What does it matter if we're physically here worshiping at the corner of college in spring or, and I'm speaking to you watching now, you're still in your pajamas drinking coffee. What does it matter? All the planning and all the second guessing is not going to change the fact that each and every one of us was created by God to do His work in this world. So when our plans fall apart, we need to remember the show must go on. This is why we do what we do. This is why we give our time. This is why we give our talent. This is why we give our financial gifts. The show must go on, even when God is laughing, especially when God is laughing. I want you to think about this this week. This is the last thing I'm going to say to you. I am convinced, I am convinced that all we need to know in order to be good stewards of the gifts that God has given us is that one day God was walking by the water and God started playing with mud. And God breathed into us. God made us fearfully and wonderfully. For the show must go on. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, so be it. Amen. My dear friends, like the saints who have gone before us, let us stand and confess what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal God and ruler of the universe, we give humble thanks for our very existence. Jesus Christ, you are the Word made flesh. We, your unworthy brothers and sisters, are grateful for your forgiveness and grace. Holy Spirit of God and Jesus the Christ, we are so dependent upon your wisdom and guidance and sustenance in all of life. We acknowledge that our destiny is in you alone. None other can save us, none other can so enrich our lives, and none other is the source of love. So strengthen our faith, God, deepen our commitments, and use our confused and ambiguous efforts for strong good in the world that you love so dearly. We thank you, Lord, that you continue to call women and men and young people to serve the cause of your kingdom. Teach us the content of our faith that we might speak with wisdom and knowledge. Show all of us the gentle, humble spirit of Christ that we might live our lives without offending the gospel message. This morning we continue to pray for peace and stability throughout the world. We pray for for peace among the Israelis and the Hamas throughout the Middle East and North Africa. We pray for peace in Pakistan, in the Philippines, in Ukraine, in Mexico, in Colombia, in the Central African Republic. God, places all over the world being torn apart by violence. God, wherever people are suffering and dying through no fault of their own, grant guidance and sensitivity to our president and to Congress and to all governing leaders whose decisions so great greatly influence the lives of their people. This morning, God, we pray especially for our young ones, wherever they might be and in whatever situation they might find themselves, whether at home or in college, in the armed forces, in other cities and in other countries, in wonderful places in their lives. We also pray for them in the uncertain places of life, those who are undergoing difficulty and trouble, Help us, God, to entrust them to your providential love. Do not let us neglect to pray for them. Remind us again and again of the miracle of grace and that each of us has been welcomed home from the far country by you, our loving God. Lord, bless the sick, comfort those who grieve. Hear all our prayers that we bring to you in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let us continue in our worship now by giving our tithes and offerings to God.
Well, Heavenly Father and gracious God, we truly give you thanks for the good gifts you have bestowed upon us. And so we pray, O Lord, that as your good stewards, we may use this tithe and this offering to continue the good work of your Son, Jesus Christ, until he comes again. For it is in his holy name we pray. Amen. So, my friends, the show must go on, and we must go out into this world, proclaiming for all to hear that the good news is truly good. So go, and go with God, and go in peace, and may God be with us all until we meet again. Amen. Go in peace.